Good morning, everyone. Or should I say, argh, me hearties. Anyway, today we're going to uh, have a little bit of fun, I hope. I'd like to welcome you to my, this presentation. We're going to kind of leap back in a little bit to maritime history today. Uh, and you know, we've been talking about places in the sea and all that kind of stuff. So today we're going to talk about the pirates and privateers, the real ones. I may mention a couple of them that aren't so real, uh, but the real ones that were the scourge of the Caribbean and uh, basically the seas off the east coast of North America. And there were ladies. Well, they weren't ladies, but they were women pirates, and we're going to talk a little bit about them. We're going to meet them as well. Uh, but first, why don't pirates take a bath before they walk the plank? Well, because they know they're going to wash up on shore later. <laughs> you put it in. I <laughs> Anyway, pirates have been around for thousands of years, and ancient history is full of stories about pirates harassing ships on the open ocean. From the very first time that someone took something of value out on a boat or on a ship to transport it over the water, pirates were there who wanted to steal it. The earliest documented instances of piracy were, in the, were the sea people who threatened the Aegean and the Mediterranean. That was back in the 14th century BCE. Now, during their voyages, the Phoenicians seemed to have sometimes resorted to piracy, and they specialized primarily in kidnapping boys and girls to be sold as slaves. Uh, in the 3rd century BC, the pirate attacks on Turkey drove many of the people on that country into poverty. On a voyage across the Aegean, <clears throat> Julius Caesar was kidnapped by pirates, and he was held prisoner. Uh, the pirates demanded a ransom of 20 ducats of gold. Well, everybody knows Caesar had a little bit of an ego, maybe just a little bit of an ego, and he insisted he was worth at least 50 ducats of gold. So the pirates said, okay, 50 ducats it is. Well, Caesar's family pulled together the 50 ducats of gold, and they gave it to the pirates, and the pirates let Caesar go. Well, Caesar wasn't happy with that because he didn't like losing that 50 ducats, so he went back, pulled together a fleet and an army, and went back out, got his ransom back, and killed all the pirates. Well, nobody ever said pirates were really all that smart. Uh, anyway, uh, there were Slavic pirates uh, that invaded Dalmatia in the 5th and 6th centuries, and they raided all along the Adriatic Sea, and those raids increased until the whole area was not safe for travel. The most widely known and perhaps the, the most far-reaching, if you will, called them pirates, were the Vikings. Now, in medieval Europe, uh, they were considered pirates, but basically they were explorers and raiders, and they were just looking for a nice place to go. You know, such comfortable places as Iceland and Greenland and well, Russia and Northern Europe. Anyway, uh, but they were ra essentially raiders, warriors, and looters. They came from Scandinavia, uh, and they were in power, if you will, from the 8th to the 12th century. So they had a pretty good run. The lack of centralized power all over Europe during the Middle Ages pretty much favored piracy across the continent. And toward the end of the 9th century, Moorish pirate havens all along uh, the coast of France and Italy were established. I mean, they were really, really active there. And those raiders came far inland uh, when they came up north, and they went to Rome. They sacked Rome and even damaged the Vatican. And along about the same time, Arab pirates were raiding all along the entire Mediterranean. But the story of the real pirates of the Caribbean didn't begin until the 15th century. Why? Nobody was here. Okay, you had to wait till after that guy Chris uh, Columbus got here in order to have something to make it worthwhile. But anyway... Uh, they started about the 15th century, and to put it into kind of a, a, give you an idea of how things were, life at sea during that period was pretty intolerable. Uh, the sailors worked very long hours. They had low pay, inadequate food, uh, I should say pretty crummy food, and they were pretty badly treated. And many sailors would desert at the first opportunity, often to take up lives as pirates. Now, it's easy to understand why Spanish ships had such a high desertion rate. Picture this. Imagine the prospect of being poorly fed and badly treated while protecting the gold on a galleon. Now, it's really one thing to die trying to get rich, 
It's totally another thing to die poor while protecting some rich guy's gold. The Spanish main was made up in the beginning of the Spanish colonies that surrounded the Caribbean Sea, basically the whole area that we're sailing through. From the 15th to the 18th centuries, the area was a source of enormous wealth in the form of gold, silver, gems, and spices. <clears throat> the booty was shipped off to Spain on its famous treasure fleets. And with a lack of, you know, no law enforcement, no military presence, a pretty heavy dose of greed, and some envy by other European countries, the Spanish main became the favorite haunt for pirates and privateers. I guess who was after all those riches? Pirates, privateers, mutineers, and buccaneers. No matter what you want to call them, they all committed robbery and other violent acts for gain on the high seas. We've got to kind of sort out the subtle difference between their monikers so that you don't, well, maybe it'll be more confusing, but anyway, that makes it more fun. Uh, buccaneers were French deserters on the islands, and they were settlers in the Caribbean, and they barbecued meat or smoked wild boar and oxen. A bucan is a frame, a wooden frame that was used by the South American natives. Uh, they used it for roasting and smoking meat over an open fire. Uh, the buccaneers found that it was much more profitable hunting the Spanish ships and looting their treasure. The way it worked is they would lure the ships in close because what did those ships want for their buffet? They wanted some nice fresh meat and some smoked meat and so on. So they would smell from the smoke coming off of these big barbecues on the beach. They, oh man, there's some short ribs. Mm, there's some of that uh, Korean mm, barbecue. Oh, we've got to go in there. And they would come in close to shore. Well, when they came in close to shore, the buccaneers would get in their boats and they would go out and they would raid the treasure she ships, steal all the treasure. It was easy because the crew on the ship was hungry. Anyway, this is a painting by a man named Howard Pyle, and he is perhaps the most famous illustrator of pirates and buccaneers. Uh, he was known as the father of American illustration back in the early 20th century. In combat, the buccaneers were ferocious. Uh, they were, rep were reputed to have been experts with flintlock weapons, knives, and the boarding axe, as well as the cutlass. Uh, cutlass is a short, very broad-bladed sword, very heavy, <clears throat> and they liked it because it could break the blade of an officer's sword, which was a long, skinny sword. They loved the cutlass, and it was also short for combat on a, on a ship. Uh, the preferred gun, though, was the blunderbuss. That was a short gun with a big, wide barrel that you put a handful of grape shot in, and with one shot, you could wound a new number of people. So you didn't have to carry a lot of loads. You just had one to fire off. Uh, the buccaneer crews operated pretty much as a democracy, and the captain was elected by the crew. <laughs> okay, so how many people will like our captain? No, we won't go there. <laughs> anyway, if a captain wasn't successful, they uh, usually voted to replace him. Now, nobody really talks much about what happens to the captain after he gets voted off the island, but you could kind of imagine. The spoils were pretty much divided evenly into shares, and special portions were given to crew members who were injured, performed special or heroic acts, or were essential to the whole crew's success. The buccaneers took specialists as captives. You know, there could be somebody like a surgeon or a carpenter. I guess those were sometimes the same guy, but anyway, <laughs> they, would, they would take these specialists from ships that they had captured, and they would keep them. Uh, they might keep them for several years, but those specialists who were captives on board were rarely, if ever, given a share of the booty. Marooner is another name for pirate in the Spanish main. Uh, it's really a corruption of the Spanish word cimaruna. Uh, that was loosely translated as deserter or runaway, and those were people who deserted or ran away, and it included, among other things, uh, escaped African slaves that were brought to the Americas by Spanish to work in their mines. Uh, later, the pirate punishment of leaving, uh, of leaving shipmates on small spits or small islands uh, entered the language as being marooned or marooning. Uh, the most famous of all of those was a privateer by the name of Alexander Selkirk. Anybody know who he was? Robinson Crusoe. He wasn't an opera singer. He was a privateer. Anyway, he was a privateer, and, and Daniel Defoe used him as the inspiration for the book Robinson Crusoe. 
Uh, privateers were basically little more than legalized pirates. The captains of private vessels were hired or commissioned into service with a thing called a letter of mark that came from the crown. Now, letters of mark were documents that authorized the captain to attack and plunder enemy ships on the high seas. The use of privateers was pretty popular among European monarchs because the cost of maintaining a naval fleet was pretty prohibitive. And why maintain a fleet if you could just hire some guy to go do it? Huge profits could be made from privateering, and that made it pretty respectable in the, in the communities. Uh, captains were paid a substantial portion or share of whatever they uh, captured from enemy ships, and the rest of the booty either went to the crown or in, later on went to investors that gave money to these people to help build ships and so on. And a lot of noblemen and business people all across Europe financed privateers in order to get a return of the shares. The first recorded act by a privateer in the Caribbean occurred back in 1523, and it was by a Frenchman named Jean Fleuret. Now, Fleuret uh, captured a Spanish caravel. There, he got it. All right. And that was loaded with treasure from the New World. When he got back home, word quickly spread, and the first confirmation of the vast wealth that was found in the colonies finally reached Europe. Convoys were tempting targets for the English and the Dutch ships during their wars with Spain. Because of that, the king of Spain ordered all of his ships into fleets that were called flota for safety. And twice a year, a flota would be loaded with gold and silver and jewels and all kinds of other goods. Uh, and it would be formed up in the Americas in one of several different ports. Uh, in order to protect this, these flotas and keep them somewhat of a secret, Spain also forbid ships from other nations from trading in the Spanish Caribbean settlements. In retaliation, the French attacked places like San Juan, Puerto Rico, and raided all along the coast of Venezuela. Another famous pirate or privateer, now this all depends on your point of view, was Francis Drake. Uh, he worked with the blessing of the British government in the form of a letter of mark from the Queen. Drake tormented the Spanish so intently and so relentlessly that he earned the nickname El Drake, or the Dragon. Uh, defining piracy on the high sea, though, is not always so easy. Who as a pirate can depend on your point of view? Uh, many early privateers in the Caribbean were basically English captains and sailors, and they were really sent by the crown to attack Spanish treasure fleets. So if you think about it, eh, Drake was just doing his job. All the gold and silver in the Spanish main took, uh, that they took from Peru particularly passed up to Panama by mule train. There it was loaded onto ships in a place called Nombre de Dios, and it was to be sent off to Spain. Now, before the treasure was shipped, there was always a two- or three-week-long fair, a big festival in the port. Now, those festivals were intended to kind of make all the people feel good that they were shipping all this stuff back for Spain, but it was like putting big ads in the New York Times, notice, notice, ships coming out loaded with gold and silver, or putting a big billboard up. Well, anyway, there was a fair that was underway when Francis Drake decided he didn't want to wait for the ships to come out, so he attacked the port. Well, when he returned to England, he had gold and jewels and spices that were valued at about 600,000 pounds. Now, that was in 1579, and if you kind of run that through all kinds of weird formulas, in today's money, that's about $72 million. That's not bad for a day's work. And he did it using a galleon. Now, the galleon was an ocean-going ship that evolved in the 16th century. They were pretty stable and relatively fast. Uh, they were pretty maneuverable also. Uh, galleons were usually under 500 tons, but you could find occasionals that were up to about 2,000 tons. Uh, they were purpose-built ships that uh, were stronger, more heavily armed than others, and the galleon uh, could be used as a warship, a transport, just about anything you wanted it to be. Give you an idea of the size, you could lay one on its side and stick it in this room. It would be a little wider than the room is high, but the rest of it would fit. Anyway, the treasure fleets sailed uh, from a network of ports because they decided Nombre de Dios wasn't such a good idea after all. So they started using other ports like Havana, uh, Cuba, San Juan, Puerto Rico, and Cartagena, Colombia. 
And all of those fleets went to the same place. They all went to Spain. They transported all the treasures, silk, gold, gems, spices, tobacco, uh, you name it, all kinds of exotic goods that came out from uh, the local area. And every one of those ships was charged a thing that was called the Quinto Real. That was one-fifth of the total value of the non-crown-owned cargo that was kept by the crown as kind of a tax. Wow, how would you like a 20% sales tax to come on top of everything you bought? I think we'd scream bloody murder. <coughs> Elizabeth I knighted Drake for his success, and he was viewed as a hero by the English and, of course, given free reign by the queen to, ha to harass the Spanish. The Spanish considered Drake and the other English captains all to be pirates. Drake did make several more voyages to the Caribbean with about the same, I guess you'd call it, outstanding results as far as riches were concerned. Pretty much he was ruthless and was reported to have sacked and burned several colonial cities of Spain as well as exhorting huge amounts of money. Drake really set the standard for privateers who came after him. Uh, and the line between privateer and pirate got pretty vague over time. I mean, people just decided to step over that line quite often. About 20 years after Drake's last voyage, England finally banned the use of privateers, and that was because the privateers were too often acting as pirates. So they said, we're not going to do that anymore. Well, that would only be the first in a whole succession of times when one time they would ban it, and then a couple of years later they'd get in a squabble with some country, and they'd say, okay, we want privateers again, and that would go on for a few years, and then they would ban it again. So it would go back and forth, and that was also true for other countries in Europe. The Dutch colonies in the Spanish Main were rare until about the 17th century, and then along with using traditional privateer anchorages in the Bahamas and Florida, the Dutch West India Company settled a commercial town in Curaçao. That's where we're going to be tomorrow, in the Caribbean. In 1627, Dutch Admiral Piet Hein, he was a director of the company, he sailed with over 3,000 privateers aboard a fleet of 36 vessels to capture Spanish ships in the Caribbean. He seized a Spanish uh, fleet with millions of gold and silver coin and other treasures. And it was the first major success for the Dutch in their conflicts with Spain. Once the Dutch were involved, a new era began. And writers glorify this as the golden age of piracy. Uh, but as you kind of will learn, it may have been golden for some, but it certainly wasn't glorious. Uh, pirates were the scourge of the Caribbean well into the 1800s. Ah, everybody here heard of Captain Morgan's rum? This guy has kind of shifty eyes, so we got to kind of pay attention to him. Anyway, he was among the most dangerous men who sailed in the Spanish main, Captain Morgan, good old Henry. Uh, and he was in the 17th century. And although he considered himself as a privateer rather than a pirate, several of Morgan's attacks were uh, without legal justification, and they were, in fact, acts of piracy. He was pretty bold and ruthless. Uh, he fought England's enemies for 30 years. Uh, he became very wealthy in the course of his uh, adventures, I guess you'd call them. And Morgan assembled a pirate fleet or a privateer fleet of ships in a way that was most different from almost every other admiral of the time. Instead of putting up handbills or putting a wanted column, uh, help wanted column in the New York Times, he would literally sail into little harbors where the pirates were located, and he would just go say, come and join me, come and join me. Uh, he was fearless in doing that, and he always got a lot of people to follow him. He dressed in silk, and he wore fancy gold and jewels, and it made him to appear to be very successful, so that attracted even more pirates. Uh, he was able to enlist hundreds, literally hundreds, uh, hundreds of the fiercest sailors to his side. By 1668, the Spanish were shipping tre uh, treasure directly from Puerto Bello in, in Panama, and Captain Morgan arrived on the city's outskirts by canoe. He came in from his fleet by canoe at night, and they overwhelmed the first two forts that were protecting the harbor, but the third was pretty well defended. Well, after trying several times to overcome that fort, he decided the best thing to do was to take the nuns and the priests that they'd captured at the first two forts and use them as shields as he went to attack the third, and he did successfully attack the third fort. 
A year later, Morgan assembled another fleet for a bold attack that was going to be on the Spanish. The evening after the decision was made to attack Cartagena, Colombia, there was a huge celebration. An intoxicated sailor, and sailors have been known, I guess, occasionally to maybe have a little bit of rum, uh, he accidentally lit a fuse to the explosives on Morgan's flagship, the Oxford. The Oxford was destroyed, and many men lost their lives, while others chose to just say, we're out of here, we're not going with you, Henry. Uh, Captain Morgan's fleet was now reduced to only 10 ships and about 800 men. He was forced to abandon his raid on Cartagena, so he attacked uh, Venezuela instead and then turned back up into the Caribbean. He ravaged the coast of Cuba and he became determined to lead an expedition to Panama City. In 1671, he captured Santa Catalina and 12 days later, he occupied the Chagres ca Castle in Panama. There he killed hundreds and he left a few survivors. Uh, pretty soon he decided it was time to go up the Chagres River and head toward the Pacific and Panama City. Legend has it that as he approached uh, the church of San Jose in Panama City, the priest had heard about his coming and decided, oh no, what am I going to do with my beautiful altar? So the, <laughs> the priest painted the altar black. Well, Henry showed up and all he sees is his big black altar and a priest said, hey, uh, all the gold got taken by a guy that got here before you. And Henry went, oh, that's terrible. That's too bad. So he goes to leave, and a priest said, uh, excuse me, Captain Morgan, uh, could you make a donation to my church so I can restore my altar? And Henry Morgan is alleged to have said to the priest, I do not know who's a greater pirate, you, Father, or me. <laughs> hmm. Anyway, he went on to uh, Panama City, uh, he burned the city to the ground, and its inhabitants were either killed or forced to flee. And the burning of Panama City really didn't mean any great financial gain for Morgan or for England. Uh, it was a deep blow to the Spanish pride and power in the Caribbean. The sack of Panama violated a... <laughs> I love this. They, they, there was a treaty that had been signed between England and Spain, and they decided they weren't going to do this kind of stuff anymore. But the sack of Panama happened after that occurred. Well, Morgan was arrested, and he was returned to England for trial. And basically, he said, um, you have to understand, my internet receiver was down. So I, I, I didn't know you guys signed a treaty, so I'm innocent. You can't blame me for doing something that I was a violation of something I knew nothing about. Well, they did. They, they let him go. They found him innocent. Not only did they find him innocent, but they knighted him. King Charles said, okay, Henry, here you go. And he returned to Jamaica, and he was given the post in Jamaica as lieutenant governor. Now, Sir Henry's death occurred uh, back in 1688, and he died a hero. And, and his death was signaled all across the island by forts and ships and merchants firing their cannons. Uh, he was buried in a small cemetery at Port Royal, uh, unfortunately, you can't visit his gravesite because it sunk uh, beneath the sea after an earthquake several years later. But his legacy can be summed up in a code of ethics that he wrote for his crews. Uh, it defined what the men were entitled to for loss of things like a limb or an eye or whatever, as well as from the spoils that were based on their jobs. Now, Captain William Kidd was either one of the most notorious pirates in history or the most unjustified and persecuted privateer. Uh, despite the legends and myths surrounding him, his career saw only a handful. There were just a few skirmishes uh, followed by a desperate quest by him to clear his name. The first recorded incident of him is when he was a 44-year-old member of a French and English privateer crew in the Caribbean. Now, you kind of have to go back into that era. Forty-four years old for a sailor was an old guy. I mean, when I first went to the, came out of the academy, went to my first ship, I looked at my commanding officer. He was 44 years old, and I thought he was older than anything. Of course, I changed my mind when I got ready to retire, but that's a different story. Anyway, Kidd and other members of that crew mutinied. Uh, they ousted the captain, and they sailed to Nevis in the British West Indies. They renamed their ship the Blessed William. And then in 1691, Kidd 
decided, well, maybe I've got to get a little more, more respectability. So he married a wealthy widowed English woman in her early 20s. Uh, they lived in New York City. And that made Kidd, if you will, pretty much a member of the New York's elite society. He was a very proper man. But he was pretty bored with life on shore, so he decided it was time to go back to sea. After several raids, not very many, three or four, he became a wanted pirate, and the English men of war searched for him all over the oceans. He was arrested in 1699 and placed in stone prison in London. Conditions of his imprisonment were extremely harsh, uh, and they may have driven him kind of eh, temporarily insane. Uh, actually, probably would have driven me totally insane, but nonetheless, they, he went a little bit over the edge. Uh, Kidd was shocked to learn that he was charged with murder and five counts of piracy. The court found him guilty on all charges, and he was hanged two years later. Well, actually, he was hanged more than once, because the first time they hung him, the rope broke. And they decided, well, that's unfortunate, so they got a new rope, and they did it again. Finally, after... Uh, uh, they finally got him hung, and then after he was hung, they took his body and they hung it up in a gibbet, which is like a steel cage, covered him with tar, and hung him on the end of a pier over the Thames River so that other sailors would see that as a warning not to turn to piracy. Well, did William Kidd leave any treasure behind? Back in 2007, not that long ago, a newspaper headline read, Pirate Captain William Kidd's Ship Possibly Found. Actually, they know now it was his ship. The wreck had been sought for years by many treasure hunters and various governments. And they finally, an underwater archaeology team found it, uh, and they discovered the shattered remnants of the ship. It's, it was believed at the time to have been captained by the notorious William Kidd. Amazingly, this was under just 10 feet of water, right on the shore of the Dominican Republic. Uh, historians believe that the ship was scavenged of treasure, everything taken off of any value, and then it was burned when it was abandoned back in 1699. They found barnacle cannons and anchors that were all found on Kidd's ship. Edward Teach was also known as Blackbeard. Oh, man, this guy was notorious. He was born in Bristol, England. Now, Teach was a pretty big guy. He had a long black beard that he would braid and tie with pretty little ribbons. Now, Blackbeard rarely passed up an opportunity to build on his reputation as a kind of a devil or a fiend. Uh, to add to his imposing looks and reputation, he would take cannon fuses dipped in lime water and saltpeter, and he would stick them under the edge of his hat or stick them in his beard and then light them. And then the smoke would encircle his head and give him a pretty intimidating look. Now, Blackbeard had 14 wives, and he wore candles in his beard and drank gunpowder in his rum. I got to tell you, the only thing that scares me about that is having to answer to 14 women. <laughs> now, Blackbeard and other infamous pirates were regarded as folk heroes by people in the Caribbean and in the southeastern part of the North America. In some cases, pirate ships were given safe havens when they were in port. Towns often looked the other way during jailbreaks, and most often, juries just refused to convict. Blackbeard was ruthless when he attacked others, but by most accounts, he was pretty kind to those that cooperated with him. Arg me, hearty. Do what I tell you, and I'll get along with you. Don't do what I tell you, and I'm going to skiver your liver. Man, I think I'd go along. In the early 1700s, Blackbeard acquired his own ship, and he named it Queen Anne's Revenge. Now, this is one of my few things where I talk about Disney. This is the ship that portrayed the Queen Anne's Revenge in the Disney movies with Johnny Depp. This is actually a boat called the Sunset, which is a little motor propeller-driven craft, and it's a combination, has this movie set built on top of it. Usually it was used for things like taking care of oil rigs offshore and so on. Anyway, it appeared in the Pirates of the Caribbean films with Johnny Depp and all that. Uh, Basically, it was supposed to be like a 200-ton ship, and there were a few smaller vessels that uh, Blackbeard plundered uh, all along the southeast seaboard of North America and into the Caribbean. But finally, 